Hey, welcome to Harrisburg Baptist Church. We're really thankful that you've chosen to join us today for worship. If you're watching this service live, while you're watching in that live stream, let us know that you're here. Make a comment, let us know how we can pray for you. We wanna have a relationship with you this morning. And if you're watching later during the week, reach out the same way. Send us a message on social media, contact our church office. We care about you and we want to know what God is doing in your life. So thank you for joining us in worship today. And before we move into worship, I wanna make an announcement related to regathering as a church. We've been announcing the potential of gathering again on June the 14th. And so our task force met this past week. We've looked at where Lee County is, what God is doing here in, in our church and how we're being led and how things are working in relation to the virus. And after a long time of thought and prayer together, the task force is recommending that we move back to June the 28th. So we are now aiming at June the 28th as our date to regather. Uh, that day of regathering is going to come with multiple options for, uh, for, for where to worship. There'll be a family option, uh, family with younger children option. There's going to be an option that takes into consideration those who are uncomfortable uh, with being around those who aren't wearing masks. We'll have a mask only option that morning and our sanctuary will be available as well. And so we'll give you a lot of very fine tuned details in this next week uh, so that you can know what it's going to look like. And you can be praying for us. Uh, that task force, when it regathers on June the 17th, will gather uh, to make a final decision on opening up on June the 28th. And in between now and then, we're encouraging you to host a, a watch party in your home with a few friends that fits with the CDC guidelines. We're encouraging you to gather together in fellowships with your Sunday school classes in your homes and spend time together. Be around one another. Be the body of Christ to one another. And we do look forward to worshiping together again. We're confident that this is the way the Lord is leading us, and we're looking forward to June the 28th. And so between now and then, let's begin getting back together and worshiping together in the ways that we are able. We'll put as much information as we can in front of you this week. And I, I want to thank you for the way that you have been the encouragement that you have been, the way that you have handled not just the virus, but the way that you've been towards each other as a church. And so now as we move into worship this morning, let's pray for God to continue changing who we are and transforming who we are as his people as we worship together and as we hear from the word. Thanks for taking time this week to gather in this way to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
Good morning, Harrisburg family. I hope you've had a great week in the Lord. Join us as we continue to sing God of Angel Armies. Let's join in and sing this morning. For the last few months, we've gathered in this moment and we've uh, acknowledged God's faithfulness. We've also acknowledged his provision and his care. And we've thanked you for your faithfulness, both in gathering and worshiping in the ways that we have been able and the encouragement that you are to one another, the faithfulness and your giving to support the kingdom. And I want to say it again. Thank you. Thank you for the way that you are leaning in to what God is doing right now rather than leaning away and leaning back. And as we pray together, I want to pray about something else for us. One of the things that is healthy for us spiritually is to have a moment where we bring our sin and our sinfulness to the Lord 
and we acknowledge it before him and we confess it before him. And, and so what I'm going to ask for you to do is here, I'm going to be silent again, kind of like we did last week and just take a minute and whatever you have in your life, whatever has been weighing on your heart and your mind in the recent days that you need to confess to the Lord, then we want to give you a moment to confess quietly, just to, to silently pray and, and bring your sin and come to the Lord for forgiveness and draw close to him as we continue in worship today. And so I'm going to bow my head. And as I bow my head quietly, you take a minute and you pray and you bring your sin and confess your need for him. Uh, and then in a moment, I'll pray for us and we'll pray a prayer of praise. And we'll also pray a corporate prayer of confession, but also then one of thankfulness for the grace that God gives to us. So let's bow together and bring what's happening in our lives to the Lord, asking for forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your holiness. We acknowledge your majesty and your wonderfulness towards us. We want to thank you for the grace that you have given to us, Father, on behalf of Harrisburg. I want to recognize and confess that we are sinners who are in deep need of our Savior. And we thank you for the forgiveness that you have given to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the mercy that you have shown to us. Father, we need you. And we pray that you would continue to meet all of our needs, that you would give us the grace that we need to walk with you, that you would provide for us, that you would meet our needs day in and day out as your children. And God, we are thankful. We are, we are grateful for the work that you've done for us in Christ. And we pray for your help as we seek to live for you. Father, your help as we seek to be light in a dark world, as we seek to be salt in a world that has lost its taste of good. Father, help us. Help us to be faithful to you when times are difficult. Lord, we are grateful and humbled at the grace through Jesus Christ that you have given to us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Hey, as we spend some time in the Word today, I want to remind you, uh, as we have week in and week out, this is an opportunity for us to hear from the Lord. And I'm thankful that He speaks to us through His Word. And we want to pray together this morning that His Word will change us and renew us and transform us, that He will equip us, He'll instruct us, He'll correct us and move us more towards the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, because of the time we spend in the Word today. So join with me as we pray together, and then we're going to look into Matthew chapter 5. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this opportunity. Lord, I personally thank you for the privilege that it is to herald and to proclaim your good news. And I pray, Father, that this morning as we're gathering around our tables and gathering in our living rooms, and maybe it's not Sunday and someone's watching this and it's a Monday or a Tuesday evening and they're sitting there just listening on the phone, hoping for hope and help for them today. God, we pray that you would use your word with the help and the power of your Holy Spirit to change us or to help us to be more like Jesus, to find comfort and rest for our souls. And so, God, I pray that this would be your moment, this would be your opportunity, that what is said would be true, that it would be honoring, that it would be pleasing in your sight. And, Lord, that it wouldn't just be life-changing for those who are listening. God, I pray, even as I preach this morning, that you would do this work in me. God, I thank you for your son, Jesus, and we pray now that you would speak to us in power and in grace and in truth. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. So as we gonna be in Matthew chapter five, if you will turn to the copy, your copy of Matthew chapter five, I'm gonna read for us again, beginning in chapter five, verse one, we're gonna work towards verse eight today. We've worked our way from the beginning of the gospel of Matthew going back into December, uh, and we have been working through Matthew chapter five. We took a little break for a sermon series entitled Lessons from Quarantine. And as we're beginning to go back into Matthew chapter five, we are working verse by verse through this moment in Jesus's Sermon on the Mount and discovering characteristics of true disciples, things that happen for those who are actually his followers, who are a part of his kingdom. And as you've made your way to Matthew chapter five, I wanna read for us again, beginning in verse one. It says, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And that verse, that verse eight, that, that's our focus this morning. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And as we work our way through this characteristic and begin to see what it means to be pure in heart, all of the characteristics, all these aspects of true disciples, they are only possible with the help of the Lord. There's no way to be this way. There's no way to be this kind of person without God doing something in us. 
These aren't characteristics that you can accomplish on your own. When you read through this poor in spirit, when you read through and see those who are mourning over their sin, who, those who are comforted then by the Lord, those who are humble, those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, those who are showing mercy because they've been shown mercy, all of these characteristics are the result of what God has done in us. And it's so, as we've mentioned before, it, it kind of parallels the Ten Commandments. As God lays claim to his people, he redeems his people, saves them from Egypt, and then as he saves them and sets them apart, he then says, this is how you should now live. This is how my people will live. And Jesus is doing the same thing here for us helping us to see and to understand that those who are his, those who've been saved, will live this way. You see, these are characteristics that follow God's work in your life. They don't precede it. They follow it because salvation is not earned. Salvation is giving and given by, to us by the Lord. And God does more than just change your eternal destination when he saves you. It changes your present day relationship with him. It changes how you live your life from that moment forward. You're not just saved from sin and its consequence of hell. You're saved to God. You're saved to live with and for him from now into eternity. And so as we think about the characteristic of, of a true disciple that's here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, we would say this this morning, that true disciples are pure in thought, motivation, and feelings. It's right there. True disciples are pure in, in thought, motivation, and feelings. And before we examine what it means to be pure, I want to look at what Jesus means or what even the Bible as a whole means because they're one and the same when it speaks about our heart. You see, in Scripture, the heart refers to the core or, or, or the center of who we are at the, at the core of our being. The word heart encompasses the mind, it encompasses the will, and it encompasses our emotions. And so when it talks about our heart, that it, it's, it, it's reminiscent of what we hear when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's helping us to see the all-encompassing nature of our relationship with him. You see, in Romans 1.21, we see the heart referring to our thoughts when it refers to our mind. And it says in verse 21 of Romans 1, For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless, and their senses, senseless hearts were darkened. That the darkening of the heart comes with the loss of sense in the mind. In Romans 2 verse 5, it talks about the heart. And when it talks about the heart in Romans 2, it refers to our motivations. You see in verse, six, verse 5 of Romans 2, it says, Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you were storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. It refers to our will. Romans 5 verse 5, talking about the heart, refers to our feelings and our emotions when it says this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That he's talking about our emotions. He's talking about our feelings. But in our culture, when we say heart, we usually don't mean mind or will. We usually mean passion or emotion. And so in the same way that when Jesus talks about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and when he quotes it from the Old Testament, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength, and we're, we, we need to be centered on God. In Matthew 5, 8, he's talking to us about our heart, aiming at the core or the center of who you are. You might find yourself then saying that Matthew 5.8 is saying, Blessed are the pure in mind, will, and emotion, for they will see God. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, who have this single-minded devotion, whose emotions and whose thoughts and whose will are all centered on what God wants, that there is a pure heart in them. But the problem with the idea of purity of our heart is that the Bible tells us that we are wicked and sinful to the core. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Hear that again. The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? Matthew 12 verse 34, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees said, Brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart that the evil coming out of their mouth, Jesus connects to what's in their heart. 
Matthew 15, verse 19, for from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, and slander. Out of the heart. It's not just that murders come out of the heart and are evil, but even slanderous or false testimonies, rumors, gossips, things like that come from the evil within our hearts. So if the heart of man is stained with sin, if at our core the Bible tells us that our hearts are deceitful, that it is wicked beyond anything else, that it's incurable, and the evil things that we say and the bad things that we do and the horrible thoughts that we think, if all of that is coming from within our hearts, how then do we reconcile this call where Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, that Jesus would go so far as to say those who are his, who are his truly disciples, that they are characterized by a purity of mind and will and emotions. What do we do? How then can we truly be blessed, as he says, or happy if our hearts are so dark? Can we really be pure? When it comes to purity, we are only able to purify ourselves in any way because of the purity that God has done for us. See, we can only pursue purity in our lives because we've been made pure by God. We've come to see the true purity that is in Jesus Christ. You see, God is the only one who can make your heart pure. That's the answer to our dilemma. What do we do when our hearts are dark? And Jesus tells us to be pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they're going to see God. How else are we going to be able to see God? Is there a way to see God? Is there a way to be clean? You see, some would take that question and say, well, it doesn't really mean that we're that impure or we're that corrupted. And they would go away from Scripture and say that, well, really at our core, we're really actually good. But that contradicts the Bible related to our core. So when God tells us that we're corrupted and then calls us to a life of purity, He then also shows us in Scripture that he is the only one who can make us pure. You could try, though, and some do. Some try to cleanse themselves with with having a, a certain ethic of life or a certain list of moralities that they follow. Some people spend their whole lives trying to do the right thing in hopes that it will outweigh the bad. That, that somehow it's this idea that if I do good things, the good things work against the bad things and push the bad things out of my heart. But the Bible says that it is out of our hearts that the bad things are coming. The words, the thoughts, the attitudes, the actions. But you could try and, and, and you may be trying. You may have devoted your life to trying to cleanse yourself with good works. You can also adopt a religion or a practice of selflessness or simplicity in hopes that 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 would somehow have a cleansing effect on your life. I've had conversations in my lifetime with people who would say, well, I was a bad person before, and I'm trying to make up for all those bad things with all the the good things. So I've adopted a religion, or I've, I've chosen to be selfless in my way of life, or I've chosen to be simple. And you might even be thinking, well, pastor, that sounds a whole lot like the things Jesus tells us to do. But you see, the issue with this is the good ethics or right morals or religious practices or even selflessness or simplicity, they don't change what's on the inside. You don't have a have a cleansing power when you do good things. Doing good things doesn't change what's at the core of your being. It doesn't change your soul. It doesn't have some mystical effect. That's why when you read in Psalm 51, verse 10, as David is writing, and just after having committed great sin of adultery and then commanded his army with an order that led to the murder. He was intending to kill someone, so he led to the murder of one of the men in his army because he was married to the woman David had committed adultery with. And as she's pregnant with his child, and then their child is born, and their child becomes sick, and the child is dying. And all the weight of David's sin, 
all the consequences of his sin are weighing on him and he cries out in Psalm 51.10 in a place of darkness and in a place of hopelessness and in a place of desperateness. He says, God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. In, in, in the moment where the darkness of his heart is so clear to him, in a moment where his sin is in front of him and his transgressions are crying back at him and they're taunting him and the accuser is accusing him, David cries out to God because God's the only one who can make his heart pure. David cries out and he doesn't say, help me have a pure heart. He says, create a clean heart. You see, you need to be careful that your approach to Christianity isn't putting yourself above God, where you would ask God to become your servant in helping you do your things in a good way, helping you do a better thing. David doesn't come to God and say, God, help me develop a pure heart through good actions. David comes knowing that it is from the depths of his heart that he committed adultery. It was from the depths of his heart that led to the murder of one of his men. It has been from the depths of his heart that this sin has occurred in his life. And he says, God, I need a new heart. Create in me a new heart. David doesn't commit to then having a pure heart from that day forward. And it's, it's often in my counseling with individuals who are trying to live for the Lord, they go back to a day where they were aware of their sin and they tell me, but pastor, I made a commitment on that day that from that day forward, I was never going to do it again. From that day forward, I was going to live exactly how God wanted me to live. David, when he's faced with his transgression, he doesn't get on his knees and say, God, I'm committing right now to never commit adultery again, to never commit murder again. He says, I need a new heart. I need you to renew my spirit, to strengthen me. And so we need to be careful. You need to be careful that you're not trying to purify your own heart by committing to never sinning again. That you're going to, that you get twisted somehow in this thought process that you can make up for your transgressions. You can't try so hard that your past goes away. You need a heart transplant. You need God to create in you a new heart. You see, David knew the sinfulness of his own heart and he knows that his heart will only be clean and only be pure when God makes it that way. You see, David grew up knowing the word. David grew up knowing what God had promised and the promises that God had made regarding the cleanliness of heart, the giving of a new heart in the Old Testament. And you see, we begin to see here as Jesus is calling us to a pure heart and as Matthew is revealing to us who Jesus is, that God creates a pure heart in those who believe in Jesus Christ. So God is the only one who can give you purity and he then tells us he's going to give us that in Jesus Christ. For I can't help but think that with his understanding of the word, that in his mind, as David cries out, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. That as David cries out for that, surely the words of Ezekiel are ringing in his head. Because Ezekiel 36 says this, I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. How similar that is to David's cry for a clean heart and a renewed spirit. God promises through Ezekiel that there will be a day where he would fulfill that promise and he would give them a new heart. He would put a new spirit in them. You see, David prayed for that. And when we look at Christ, we see that it is through Jesus that God does what he promised he would do. 
That for those who are truly his, this is what happens when God makes a new covenant. Jesus says, I've come to make a new covenant with you, and that new covenant results in pure hearts. That new covenant results in renewed spirits, in right spirits, and in hearts of flesh that are beating to do the will of God. Hebrews 8 explains this in verses 7 through 10. It says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second one. But finding fault with his people, he says, See, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. I showed no concern for them, says the Lord, because they did not continue in my covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And in Christ, God creates a pure heart in his people. For all those who would believe, God changes who we are. God changes how we think. He changes how we feel. He changes our motivations because he creates in us a new heart. And the change that God makes in us, it's a threefold. J.M. Boyce describes it this way. That God changes the believer, as he calls it, judicially in the moment of our belief. That he does it practically during the moments of our earthly life as we yield to the gentle urging of his Holy Spirit. And that he will do it finally and completely in the moment of our death as we are then purified from all evil and brought without spot into his holy presence. Changes us. You see, a true disciple is blessed. Because he is pure before God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And at the moment of your belief in Christ, at the moment of the life-changing work of the Holy Spirit, as he works in you to save you, you're changing before God. Your standing before God has changed. Boyce calls it a judicial change. That in, in one moment, God is right to judge you and to condemn you for your sin. But the moment you believe in Christ, God declares you, he, like a judge, would grant and say, you are clean. You are forgiven. These charges are no longer against you. You've been set free. That you're, you're pure before God. That as he sees you from that day forward, he sees the righteousness of Christ because he put the sinfulness of your life on Jesus. And Jesus takes your sin and he gives you his righteousness. So a true disciple is blessed because he is pure before God. Romans 5 says this, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, They're blessed because their standing has changed. Their their relationship with God has changed because they believe in Jesus and they've been justified before God, been made right in the eyes of God. But a true disciple is blessed because he is pure with the help of God. So blessed are the pure in heart because their, their standing before God has changed, but also because they are now able to live and pursue purity with the help of God. This is what the Bible means when it talks about being sanctified. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, it's a series of questions and answers that help you to learn and to understand the truths of Scripture. In question number 35, the answer is this regarding sanctification. It says, it's the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. You see, it's a continuing change worked by God in us, freeing us from sinful habits, informing us in Christ-like affections and dispositions and virtues. It does not mean that sin is instantly eradicated, but it also is more than just a simple counteraction in which sin is merely restrained or repressed without being progressively destroyed. Sanctification is a real transformation, not just the appearance of one. And I'm afraid that we have, we have misunderstood what it means to be sanctified. 
what it means to grow and to mature. It doesn't mean that you pretend like you're Jesus's follower. Being sanctified doesn't mean that you, you let all of the sin continue to exist and freely reign in your life and you then pretend when you're around other Christians or, or pretend in, when you're around the church or can pretend when you're at work. Sanctification means that through the course of your Christian life, with the help of God, through the understanding of his word and the power of his Holy Spirit, that you are actually transformed more and more into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That as you grow and mature, godlessness and worldliness and sinfulness are not your instant reaction as you mature. That it's a real change. It's a real transformation. It's not just the appearance of one. You see, God tells us in Ephesians 4, verse 22, to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. You see, a true disciple is blessed because you're standing before God. Your purity before God is declared, but also because your purity before God, it's declared, but then you have help from God to live pure, to think pure, to feel pure, to be motivated with purity. The purity of the Christian life is pursued with the help and the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. Part of what it means when he says they will see God is that those who have been justified, those who have been declared right before God, are now living from that point forward with the help and the power of God to live for him. And in doing so, one of the ways that we see God as those who are his is we grow in our understanding and our discernment of what he wants, of what his will is, of what his desire for us with it is. That we, those who are blessed to be pure in heart are pure with the help of God that he helps them to know, helps them to discern what to do in each situation and circumstance to be faithful to him and to his word. A disciple is blessed because he's pure before God. A disciple is blessed because he is pure with the help of God. And a true disciple is blessed because he is pure in the presence of God. He's pure in the presence of God. Romans 8, 28 says this, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. true disciple is blessed because he is pure in the presence of God. Because you're going to be in his presence. If you're a follower of Christ, this is not it. This matters significantly because everything you do, everything I do, everything we do, it matters because it's for him. A true disciple is blessed because he's, he's pure before God. He's able to live and to pursue purity with the help of God, but he's also pure in the presence of God. In eternity, there will be no more sin in your mind. There'll be no more sin in your will or motivations. There'll be no more sin in your emotions. That in eternity, it's gone. That between now and then, God is working it out of our lives. He, he's shoveling the sin out as we put off the old and put on the new and pursue him. And with his help, he's transforming us and changing us. There'll be no more sin in the heart of God's children in eternity. When they are in his presence, there'll be no reason for fear. For they will be pure. Like fully and finally, completely Pure. Those who've been declared pure in heart by faith in Christ will see God face to face in eternity with no stain of sin in our hearts. See, it won't just be that we'll have the power to restrain our sin completely. 
And, and, and I'm afraid that there are times where that's how we view eternity, that I'll still be the same way that I am, but then I'll have the power to say no to temptation. Friend, in eternity, there is no temptation. In eternity, there is no disobedience. There, there is no rebellion. There is no rejection of God. The only ones who will live in eternity with God are those who've been declared pure before God, who are now being helped to live pure with the help of God, and who, when they enter into his presence, moving from justified and sanctified, they will be glorified. It's not just that you'll have the power to say no to sin. There won't be any sin. There'll be no sin in your heart. And when there is no sin in your heart, there'll be no sin coming out of your lips, no sin happening in your mind, no sin happening against anyone else. You'll be pure in heart. They will see God. They will live with God for all eternity. Three ways to pursue a pure heart. Three ways to pursue a pure heart and just application ways, steps for us, practical things we can put our hands on. First is this, follow David's lead. First way to pursue a pure heart is to cry out to God for a clean one. For a clean one. For a new one. You don't need to do better. You just, you don't need to do better. I, I, I want you to hear me. Listen. You don't need to do a better job this week for God. You need a new heart from God. You, you can't do better with your mouth if your heart is stained with sin. You, you can't do better with your actions and better in your relationships if, if you're still the same on the inside. Blessed are the pure in heart because their hearts have changed. But as God says in the book of Ezekiel, he reaches in and he takes out that heart of stone that one that is calcified and corroding and completely opposed to him, he takes it out and he replaces it with a heart of flesh that is soft, malleable, that in its heartbeat wants to do what God wants. So don't commit to doing better for God if you've never asked God for a new heart. If your entire foundation for your relationship with God is that one day a long time ago you got on your knees and you said, God, I am going to do the best for you every day of my life and I hope that's good enough. We need to get back on our knees today. And instead of telling God that you're going to do better from this moment forward, you need to tell God, create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. Take out my sinful heart. Change my standing before you and help me live for you with your help and your power so that I can live for eternity pure in heart. Not because I did better from a certain night in my life, but because I was changed on a certain day in my life that your testimony would be that God converted you, that he transformed you, that he regenerated you, that he saved you. He pulled you out of the pits of the sin that was in your heart and he transplanted it with a heart that beats for him and that you've spent from this moment forward seeking to live for him, looking forward to the day where there's no more sin between you and him. Friend, the first step towards having a pure heart is to ask God to give you a new one. Confessing your sin, confessing your sinfulness, crying out for mercy, asking him for forgiveness. And he tells us that he is faithful, that he is just, and that he is good, and that he is gracious, that he is merciful, and he will hear your cry, and he will do it. First step for us is to cry out for help, cry out for a new heart. Second thing then is to strive for holiness by obeying the word with the help of the Holy Spirit. Think about it this way. You get new standing before God and now you have the help and the power of the Holy Spirit with you helping you to live pure before God. And so we then strive for what the Bible calls holiness. Not just being more moral than the people around us, but being holy like he is holy in our mind and in our motivations and in our emotions. Striving for holiness with the help of the Holy Spirit is the equivalent of striving to do what the Bible says. That the Holy Spirit wrote this, and so he didn't write this, so he would then tell us to do something different than this. 
So with the help of the Holy Spirit, you will only ever do what this says. The Holy Spirit will never ever lead you or guide you or give you permission or justification to do anything that goes against Scripture. So if you want to strive for holiness, he's not going to help you do something other than what the Bible says. And so what you wind up doing when you seek to obey the word is you fall in step with the plan and the will of God. And then that comes with the help and the power of God. And you can pursue holiness by obeying the word with the help of the Holy Spirit. He is not going to help you go against him. But he has promised to help you walk with him. Third thing is then to endure in your holiness by focusing on the future glory that waits in eternity. Endure in your holiness. A lot of us are just trying to endure in our belief, trying to hang on to whether or not we believe the Bible. And and if you've known the Lord for any season of time, you move beyond whether or not you believe in him or not, and you move towards whether or not you're going to be faithful to him or not. And so we endure in our holy living, not just in our thinking, but we endure in our living. We, we are striving for holiness. And then we endure in our holiness regardless of the consequences in this world, regardless of what people would think or what people would say, regardless of whether or not it would cost us our job or cost us a relationship with someone we dearly love. We would endure in right living, in holy living, endure in purity of mind and motivations and emotions because of the future glory that waits for us. Because there, there is a day coming that is real. There is a day coming that is, is motivating for us. And it is, it is something that, that leads us and guides us. We fix our eyes on our prize, our life with Christ, our eternity with him, and then we endure. You don't just get kicked by the world. You get kicked by the world while you live a holy life. You don't just get kicked by the people around you and made fun of and condemned by people. You get condemned and made fun of by people while you live a holy life. You don't just lose some friendships or lose some opportunities at work. You lose some friendships and you lose some opportunities at work while you continue to endure in the pursuit of holiness and purity. That we would endure in our holy living because we look forward to a future glory. That day where those who are pure in heart will see God face to face. That Jesus is worth all of this. Hearing well done is worth all of this. That being in his presence and not even having to guard your lips against the temptation to speak wrongly in his presence because there won't be the, the possibility for that anymore because what he began in you when he put faith in Jesus Christ, he is going to complete in you when Jesus returns and we look forward to that future glory where we live with him and we walk with him and Embraced by him, pure in heart, like him, we endure in our holiness. I think too often we're settling for something less than holy living. We're just trying to endure in our commitment to belief. What God calls us to is the purity of heart, not just to have a belief. But that belief comes with change. That belief comes with the declaration that you're right before God. It comes with the help and the power to live for God. And then we endure between then and the time that he returns for the glory of God. Knowing that it is worth everything. Because he is greater and more wonderful and more precious than anything in this world. So we endure in our holiness. So this week, when you begin to think practically, and if you've never cried out to God for a new heart, begging for the forgiveness of your sin, surrendering your life to him, and asking for him to save you, we pray that you do today. If you know Christ, we're praying for you as you strive to live a holy life for him. And as you live that holy life and as things become increasingly difficult or become hard or become just long, it's a long road. We're praying for endurance for you in your holiness.
that we would live lives worthy of the name of Jesus and that in doing so, he would use us even in the lives of other people. Friend, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Let us pursue purity of heart. Pray with me. Father, change us. And all the ways that sin is still working and moving and devouring in us, God, I pray for your help to root it out. Pray for the strength to pursue holiness. Pray for the help and the power to endure in holiness. We pray for those who are crying out right now for forgiveness, Lord, that you would give it. That you would create a clean heart in them, renew a right spirit in them, and then help them with your help and power to live in that right spirit. And Father, help us to do so until you return. Help us to do so looking towards the future glory that we will live with you in eternity. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks again for worshiping with us. We really are glad that you are here worshiping with us, growing with us. I want to remind you that on our webpage, you'll see a ton of information regarding the regathering process for us that's there. Click on that link, find out more about what's coming and what we're looking forward to. With our social media feed and on our website, you'll see a lot of information regarding missions. We're, we're gathering supplies for Delta Streets Academy. We're trying to impact uh, one of the reservations of the Navajo Indians over in New Mexico. And, and even here, we're beginning to aim ourselves in different directions where we can continue to make an impact for Christ as Harrisburg Baptist Church. So thanks for joining us in worship. And now as we move into the week, let's join together in being salt and light, living with pure hearts towards God and seeking to make a Jesus difference here in our city and all the way to the ends of the earth.